Hello, everybody. Hello, everyone. I hope you can see me in a little box and a big screen that says talent management. Good day to you all. Um, well, I'm, I would like to welcome you to this webinar focused on talent management for ELT professionals. My name is John Bunting, and I run the intensive English program at Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States. I'm so glad that you are here in this webinar. I look forward to sharing ideas with you over the next hour or so, and also hearing your ideas both today in the chat room and also when we have our Q&A session in two weeks. I'm honored to participate in this series for people like you who are starting or considering to start an ELT-focused uh, program. Here's, I wanna give you a quick caveat. As you can see on the screen, I feel very strongly that all teaching is local. And that means that what works for me in Atlanta here in the United States might not fit perfectly in your environment. As we go through various ideas today, consider them, but also reflect on how or if they would work in your setting. What modifications might be needed? What ideas just would not work at all? So with that, we're gonna get started. Now, I have watched the three previous webinars. I think that they are wonderful. Melanie Johnson's Introduction to Entrepreneurship for ELT Professionals, Anne Crutchfield's marketing and recruiting discussion, and Amy Christensen's sometimes intense, for me, I'm an English teacher, analysis of how to manage finances and resources. They all raised critical issues for anyone considering taking this big step. My talk today is the fourth in the series, and I encourage you to review the earlier ones. They're all recorded and available and also plan to see the final two webinars coming out in April and May. But today, let's talk about talent. When I first saw this topic floated as the focus, it made me, as an English teacher, wonder, what is talent here? What does that mean? And for me, you know, there's quite a range of talent that goes into running any business, including English language teaching. You need recruiting and marketing, as Anne discussed in January, administrators and finance, as Amy talked about last month. Uh, you need technology folks, people that know how to do technology. And I think you're gonna probably learn more about that next month with Marcy's talk. But I wanna focus in on our specific content, ELT, and the people that can make or break it for our students and our programs. So we're gonna be looking at talent management, which makes it sound a little bit like we're in Hollywood, but today's discussion is <clears throat> really about finding and keeping quality English teachers and also building a positive, efficient work environment. And before we get started, I just wanna share this uh, QR code link for you with you. Uh, it's on this site that you're gonna find the recording of this presentation a little later on and the previous sessions. And it will also include all the downloadable documents that I'm going to make reference to today. And let's see here. Let's check in for a minute. Take a minute to reflect on this question. When you were a teacher, and like me, maybe you still are, what were the most important issues for you? I've asked you to list three in the chat room if you can. 
but you can have more or fewer, and you can add your own ideas as well. Uh, put them in the chat room to share with us. You can just include the numbers. I'm trying to make it easier so you don't have to type so much. Uh, you know, the first one I have listed is compensation, money. That's a big one for all of us. How much do you get paid as teachers? And how is that payment determined? The second one is schedule. You know, are, is there flexibility in the schedule? Does it meet your needs? Um, the third one is professional development. Can you develop and grow in that position or in that institution? A fourth one is collegiality. Who you're working with <clears throat> and what are the relationships and dynamics that exist? The fifth one is the physical environment, where you work, how far away it is, what kind of environment you're, you're working in. Uh, the sixth one is support for student issues. Are you having challenges with students? And do you feel that you have support? The seventh one that I've listed is support for curricular is issues. What happens when you have a challenge working with the material or you feel that things are not a good fit? Mm -hmm. And then finally, the one I have is support in long-term development issues. How engaged are you as a teacher in the bigger picture of the program? Do you, do you feel invested? Do you feel involved? And you can also add others. And I see others are going into the chat room, which is nice. Yeah, the methods of learning, preparing a lesson, professional development, curricular support, and of course, I think all of us would choose number one as well, compensation. It's just the reality. And you can continue to add things. Um, and also, I think there's, there, there's, there's room in the Padlet too later on if you want. But now I want to give you some background about me. And during today's lesson, I'm hoping I'm going to learn a little bit more about you as well. So this is the building where my office is in downtown Atlanta, Georgia, uh, at Georgia State University. And you see, if you look in that building way up about the 15th floor, there's a, some lights on. That's me. I'm on the 15th floor. Running a program can mean long hours, but I do think it's worth it. And I've been doing this a long time. Uh, do you notice there's a little gray in my hair here and in the picture? Uh, I've been at Georgia State University or GSU for over 20 years. And for the past four years, I've been the intensive English program director where I needed to learn a lot very quickly about running a business. Now, you may notice that this photo includes the wonderful person I'm married to. I include this in part because I always like to see her smile, but also for another reason. When you're thinking about the talent that you wanna hire, it's important to keep in mind that each person there has a life outside of work. And when you can help them find a healthy balance between work and their life outside of work, you're going to you're going to get better work from them and you're going to create an environment where people are happy to give their best efforts. Bye Majira. Okay. Now, before I came to GSU, I created an ELT business myself in Caracas, Venezuela with my wonderful friend Tom, that handsome fellow in the photograph with me, where we learned the hard way how challenging opening a business can be. I wish that there had been webinars like the ones in this series back then. However, we did have a lot of fun over the five years we kept our program going. And we ended it because we both had left the country. But let's get back to Georgia State University. It's a public university with over 50,000 students in the heart of Atlanta, Georgia. We have over 250 different majors and almost 10,000 people employed. For the In Intensive English Program, or IEP, we are a self-funded program within the university. So that means we get no government money. 
And we have about 250 full-time students every year from all over the world. It's a five-level program that has 18 hours in class every week. And most of our students go on to study at universities in the US. Because we are self-funded, I need to run this program like a small business. And if you saw Amy's webinar on managing resources in February, you saw just how much goes into just keeping the financial records of a business. I control the budget. I do the hiring and I supervise our group of teachers and staff along with dealing with all of the academic issues. We also do a range of special programs in our IEP. From teacher training, we're bringing a group of Uzbek teachers to Atlanta this summer, very excited about that, to short programs for college students from Japanese universities, from Panamanian schools, uh, from Korea. And one of the things that we are deliberately doing is branching out to try to include a range of different types of work related to English language instruction. And I encourage you to think about that as well. Diversity in your program can protect you when one area, especially if it's your main area, starts to have some struggles due to things outside of our control. As an example, we started our aviation English program last year as a way to branch out and build a broader client base because we found there are people that were really interested in English for future pilots and future aviation mechanics. We also have started a community-based program that we run using our teachers and our staff to develop and run them. These kinds of programs are a great way to build name recognition and goodwill in the community. And in, in these programs, we work with immigrants and refugees who are facing extreme stress and financial challenges. Doing this kind of work is doing good for the community. And it also helps build our name recognition and our brand, if you go business-like on it, and it generates goodwill all across the Atlanta region. And I mention all of these initiatives to encourage everyone here to consider all possible ways to diversify and have multiple avenues to keep your organization going. You know, there's sometimes events beyond our control. So thinking about strategies to help you weather challenging times is important. And it's important for you, and it's also important for the people that work for you. Maybe you could add a translation component or online courses or a cultural competence program of courses, in addition to just straight language instruction. But now let's move on to exploring the talent. So here's our agenda. Uh, here's our agenda. The introduction is done. So next, I want to learn a little bit about you, and I'll be asking you some questions. Um, but then we're going to explore ways to find good teachers, keep those good teachers, work with staff, and foster a productive and positive environment. So what do we mean by talent? As I mentioned earlier, it can be very broad. It can include, for our purposes, material developers, recruiters, marketing and ad team, curriculum designers, administrators, and of course, teachers. For this webinar, I'm gonna focus on finding and keeping good teachers. But really, when you think about it more broadly, talent can include anyone who is gonna make your business a success. Now, throughout the webinar, I encourage you to add comments or questions in the chat room. And I won't be able to really address those today but they can be very useful during our open session in a few weeks. In addition, feel free to respond to each other in the chat room and make connections with each other. You know, you guys are entering a field that is challenging and it helps to stay connected to each other and provide mutual support in this process. As an example, I'm a member of UCEP, which is the University Consortium 
of Intensive English Programs, which is a group of about 80 IEPs across the United States. It's a group for IEP directors like me, where we can ask each other questions and work towards identifying best practices in every aspect of what we do, whether it's the business side, the curriculum side, the human resources side. And we also, we all create, we make a pact that what we say in our group stays in our group so we can be very honest. On a local level, I've also created a smaller group of uh, Georgia-based here in the US, IEPs, where we work together to find projects where we can collaborate and build efficiencies locally. But now let's take a minute to reflect on this question. What are the limits or restrictions in seeking out quality teachers? And I've got a few ideas. Choose the one or two that you see as most challenging for you. The ones I'm thinking, of course, salary. It's coming up all the time. Working hours, uh, lack of qualifications. You may find people that want to work, but that you don't think that they're actually qualified. Um, lack of teaching experience. Maybe people have gone to school, but they don't have the, the experience that you're hoping for. And you can also share your own ideas as well. And one of the things, and sometimes these things are also interconnected because lack of qualifications and salary can sometimes be connected, unfortunately, which, which makes it a challenge. Not insurmountable, but a challenge. And I see lack of qualifications has been identified. And I... An, an, another idea of, of indifference. You know, that, that raises such an interesting point when people look at teaching as just a way to make some money rather than a vocation. Um, and I think part of what is a challenge is, first of all, finding those people that will look at it as something more of a calling and not just a paycheck, and then really keeping them motivated. I know here in the United States, we struggle with that on all levels of education. Okay, let's talk about finding teachers. And a, an important first step is creating the job description. It's important to clearly identify what it is that you want from a prospective teacher and what you're going to be able to give to the teacher. Do you want someone who is just going? to teach children, someone who's just gonna teach adults. Maybe you want someone who can focus on academic English uh, or lower levels, someone with a strong focus on assessment. Do you need somebody who can do all of that? Which can also be the case. So you need to determine your needs and requirements. Do you want someone who can help with administrative tasks along with teaching? One of the things that I've done, and I'm gonna diverge for just a second, our staff, I make sure all of our staff are qualified to teach. And I encourage all of our teachers to get involved in some of the administrative tasks so that everyone, first of all, has a broader knowledge, but also they, are, they can be more uh, understanding of what their colleagues are going through. You also need to be clear about uh, what the acceptable minimum qualifications and what the preferred qualifications are. And you need to make sure you, you include any specific information or any specific issues that may be local. Sometimes the languages other than English that a teacher speaks might be important or other issues specific to a certain workplace location. Um, and of course, salary is also a local issue. Here's a question. Do you post the salary? And, you know, do you post a range of the salary? And here in the United States, it varies. 
but I would say usually it's kept pretty vague in the initial description of the job. First, you want to find who's around that has the skills, the qualification, the experience, and the desire. And then sometimes you break their heart when you tell them the salary, but that's another story. So for us here in my program, we always include the following items. The terms of the position. Is it full-time or part-time? Is there any travel required, whether it's travel to conferences or outside our area, or if, if you're going to go to different uh, locations within the area to teach different things? Is it permanent or temporary? We also need to include the workload. How many hours are going to be in the classroom? How many hours are for prep? Do you need to have office hours? Do you need to do some administrative work? All of those things need to be clearly spelled out. And then this is the biggest area, the responsibilities. You lay out all the tasks that the teacher needs to do. So it's very clear before they start. If they will, if, the, if you need them to help you with placement tests, for example, you should include it here. Or if they're gonna do student advising or any administrative tasks. And then the other thing is the benefits. Make that clear as well. What, what is there that goes beyond salary? For us, we always try when we can to provide some money for professional development. But we also always include the caveat that that depends on enrollment and budget. Oh yes, and one last thing, a reminder that we have a, uh, a sample job description is available for you to download. All of the different areas that I'm talking about, I've tried to include some sample documents that you can use when you are uh, looking at this in greater detail. So I wanna take a minute here to reflect on this question. How do you find good teachers in your area? Remember, all, all teaching is local and all hiring is local. I've listed some ideas. Number one is word of mouth. Can you just talk to people that you know, talk to people in the field and get good candidates? Or number two is print advertising. Do you pay to put something in a newspaper or some other good old fashioned print form? Number three is online advertising. Do you, do you use some online options to advertise your positions? Number four can be social media. Number five is email lists or groups that you can share it with. And also any other ideas that you have for how you use, how you find good teachers in your area. And I wanna ask you another favor. If you see one of these and you say, John, no way, that is not gonna happen in where I am. You can write down the number and then put the big word no in capital letters next to it and say, yeah, that, that part doesn't work. Because remember, I'm here in Atlanta, Georgia, where I know things that work for me, but sometimes things that work here are not gonna work somewhere else. And once you have found some potential candidates, you need to interview them. So it's very, it's really important to have a process in place to set up and handle interviews. Some advice that has served us well include forming a committee if possible, so that you get more perspectives on each candidate. Having several people involved in interviewing can help avoid personal bias or other factors that should be reduced or eliminated when possible. You also should have a set list of questions that you use for all interviews. This keeps the playing field even, as we like to say in the baseball terms, uh, for all candidates. And it also helps keep you on track as the interviewer when you're asking the question. So you make you can kind of check them off. You should avoid asking inappropriate questions. And this I think is definitely local. For example, here in the United States, 
I cannot ask about anyone's marital status, their age, if they have children, and, and a few other topics as well. It's just, it's not allowed. It's actually, legally, it's not allowed. So you have to think about appropriate and inappropriate questions, whether it's a legal issue or a cultural issue. You want to stay consistent and fair in your interview process. Try to ask the same questions of all candidates and give them the same amount of time. And then you want to be realistic but positive about the challenges that the teacher will have to face. Let them know up front if it's going to require a lot of flexibility, or maybe they're going to be in a classroom with students that the, the range in proficiency is going to be wider. And during COVID, we had to deal with that a lot, where we all of a sudden had students from different levels that we had to combine into one. It's a challenge for teachers. And the more that they know that about that, things like that or large classes, it helps, it helps prepare them uh, before they make their decision. I also want to add that you can include other elements to your interview or to the process. You can request a video recording of a previous class session that they've done. You can have them do live teaching demonstrations. You can give them a scenario and have them develop a lesson plan based on the scenario. Uh, you can also have them do multiple interviews with other stakeholders in your organization. Remember too that the team dynamic is so important. Are these people that are gonna be able to get along with the other teachers and staff? And again, we have a, a sample document with interviewing protocol that you can download. And I am gonna ask you to check in again. And this is a critical question. When you have teachers that you want in your program, you have them hired, that's a big win, congratulations. However, the next big challenge is keeping them. Take a couple minutes here to add your ideas about these. this question. What makes a teacher wanna stay in a job? And I'm looking at, I thought, no, no surprise here, right? Number one, salary. Number two is the schedule. Number three is job security, meaning you're not gonna, you're not, you don't feel like, well, if I come here next month, the place will be gone or they're gonna kick me out. Number four, a good group of colleagues. Number five is fair treatment from the administration. Number six are opportunities for professional development. Number seven is the physical work environment that you're in. And then if you have other thoughts. I like the idea about opportunities for promotion so that it's not it's not just about job security, but sort of the, the career plan, like what's going on. That's a great ex additional idea. And I see quite a few people are talking about professional development. And I and I I agree with you. I think that that's really important. And now I want to show you. I'm going to show you what a couple of teachers that I respect a lot have said about this. One teacher told me, passion, I love kids, so I feel happier to stay with kids at school, giving back to my community through education. And that's when, to be honest, when I talk about it being a vocation, that's kind of what I, that's sort of the kind of person that you love to have. My school leadership, my head teacher is very supportive and he's so empathetic and lovely. So I feel more comfortable being at school for most of the time. A great connection with my fellow teachers at school. I feel a sense of being a family. So notice here, this teacher felt so strongly about the human relationships that were being created in her work. And another teacher said, she said, I appreciate opportunities 
to work on projects I'm interested in. I really like identifying the needs of students and developing plans to address those needs. This keeps me engaged and invested in the program. So here, this teacher seems to really enjoy getting to step outside the traditional role and also <clears throat> dealing with a very restrictive curriculum. And so she can find interesting projects and being in an environment that encourages that. Uh, and she also is so focused on her students and is fe feels supported that that is part of the, the ethos of the, of the workplace environment. So there are different ways to hold on to good teachers. And I'm not really going to talk a lot about that most obvious one, salary, because that is dictated by many local factors. Obviously, if you can pay well, or at least pay better than other programs, that's a big plus. But for many teachers, money is not the only or even the main factor in deciding to stay. Well, maybe it's still the main factor, but bear with me. So we have some other ways to try to keep good teachers, providing feedback, offering support, and building community. One important strategy is providing useful, non-threatening feedback that helps teachers improve while also validating their professional sense of self. But let's take a look at that in a little more detail. One of the best ways to provide feedback is through systematic and fair observations. Many teachers have told me that they, before coming to my program, they had dreaded observations by supervisors because they feel that they are a negative experience with the director trying to, to get gotcha moments. And that means seizing on any bad moment and making the teacher feel vulnerable rather than genuinely trying to improve the teaching and learning experience. It's good to create a policy in your program on how and when observations will happen. I've included documents for all the components of observation um, on the website. So the, the policy should have these elements. So you should be able to explain how the observation process is formative, which means it helps teachers get better, and or, depending on your choice, summative, summative, yeah, which can be used for annual reviews, salary increases, you know, those kinds of things. Obviously, that's a little more stressful, but it's important to be clear with the teachers what's going on. You also should set a calendar for the observations so they have no surprises and they don't feel jumped on. Um, you should include a pre-observation meeting with forms that people can complete first on what they want to get done in the observation and then do the observation. And then afterwards, you create post-observation forms where the observer provides feedback but the instructor or teacher also gets to provide their perspective on it. And then having a post-observation meeting that follows up on all of this. And the goal is to make the experience better for students and for teachers. And then you can also include additional observation and mentoring as needed. So that if somebody is really ch challenged and having struggles, you can address that with them. In our program, we have the following policy. New instructors have an observation in their first semester and returning instructors are observed at least once a year. You may decide, I wanna do more observation than that. To be honest, I'd love to do more because I think it's very useful, but we also have to deal with a lot of other realities of our time. Uh, and additional observations can be requested or recommended. And that can be by the instructor, by the observer, or by the director of the program. And this, I think, you can modify to, to fit your specific needs. But I've found this is a really good starting point for at least thinking about that. So in our program, more specific, we have this, the policy is at the beginning of the semester, the director, that's me, determines the program observation needs and schedules. 
And you can also farm that out to somebody else. For example, if you have a curriculum director or someone else. And then for us, because our semester long program is 14 weeks, we have uh, the first observation generally in week four or five, the second observation if necessary during week nine or 10. Um, sometimes I may even require the second observation from the start, but it's good to have clarity and consistency. So your teachers know what to expect and they also don't feel like you're jumping on them because you know teachers are in a vulnerable spot. So instructors are observed for formative and evaluative purposes. <clears throat> At the post-observation meeting, they can be provided with a formal written report or just oral feedback or, or some notes. In our program, we always provide a written report, but you can modify that to suit your program's needs. <clears throat> and the instructors complete a self-evaluation of teaching observation prior, so after the observation, but before they meet to talk about the observation. This allows the instructor to reflect on what worked and didn't work from his or her perspective, <clears throat> and then how to ask for support. It's good to provide all parties with guidelines so that the process is consistent and fair. <clears throat> when you have a pre-observation, the observer and the, and the teacher can meet briefly. And we used to do it all in person, but now you can do it virtually or in person regarding the lesson plan and any concerns that the teacher has about what's going on in that class. The observer can also request a lesson plan and relevant materials prior to the observation. And here's, <clears throat> here's some ideas for what the teacher should start thinking about uh, for before the observation starts. One of the things is, what is the teacher going to say to the students about the observation itself? You know, they want to encourage students to be themselves that it's the teacher being observed, not the students, because they also can feel a level of stress. Uh, and that the observation is, is taking place so that the instructor can talk about their own classes and develop professionally. Um, it's good to be clear about what the role of the observer is going to be during the observation, how the observer is going to be taking notes or maybe recording something. Um, and what the immediate post-observation moment is going to be like. I know some teachers would love to talk to someone right there as the class is ending. And you, know, you have to sort of set the rules for that. And then you schedule a time to meet, to do that post-observation meeting. Typically, we try to do it within a week of the observation so that things remain fresh. Another suggestion before the observation is ask the instructor to submit samples of written feedback that they are providing to students. So you can see that side of it in addition to just what's going on in the classroom. And that can help frame discussions that you have. I also always ask instructor, instructors to give me a lesson plan and it can be in whatever format they typically would do it as well as any PowerPoints. Now, as I mentioned before, this can be stressful for teachers and disruptive for students. So here are some ideas that, the, that you or the person you designate to observe can say to help make the process more effective. And these are also all in the documents. Please notif notify students of my plan to observe. Let them know that I'll be observing you, not them. Let them know that I'll be taking notes and not participating in conversations or activities. Many times, the students want to engage with the observer, and that's not the role of an observer. So you need to stay outside of the, the class as much as possible. 
I'll try to get there early. I'll sit in the back or the side. I'll try to be inconspicuous. I'll probably take a lot of notes and I may look serious. <clears throat> Don't freak out. That's not a reflection on your lesson. And if you decide to change your lesson, you can let me know in advance if you know. It's okay if things don't go exactly as planned during the lesson. You want to you want to lower <clears throat> that affective level for the for the teacher because we always make changes to our lesson plans. There's always slight modifications. So if they have to adapt, they can adapt. And this is what I do is I tell them, I'm going to leave right after the class. I'm not going to talk to you. It's not that I'm angry. <laughs> I just want to go and, and you know write down my thoughts. It's not a reflection on the lesson. And I strongly encourage you to remind teachers that it's a positive opportunity to have you to have someone observe your teaching, offer suggestions, and highlight the teacher's strengths. They're under a lot of stress. We want to make it so that this is, becomes a positive learning experience. And then for the post-observation meeting, the observer would, would prepare a report, in our case, sometimes you can do something less formal, and the instructor would, com would complete the self-evaluation form. And here are some ideas for you or the person you have observing for this kind of post-observation meeting. Let the instructor talk first about the class and their impressions before offering any of your ideas. Oftentimes the instructor will bring up the same issues and it's better for it to come from them initially and then you can follow up on it. Then you can share your impressions and opinions. Uh, I also, I like to note with teachers that we all have different teaching styles. So if it's something that's just a matter of a teaching style, you can acknowledge it and suggest it. If it's something that's absolutely needs to be changed, you have to deal with that too. And then you can also make changes to your report as you guys have this, this conversation. Teachers, as I've mentioned, are in a vulnerable position in this setting. They've just been judged in their, in their minds and there's some, there's some validity to that. So try to include positive comments and couch any negative comments as concerns or suggestions for improvement. And now I wanna pause for a minute and I'm gonna to go to something that's a little dark. What makes teachers wanna leave a program? And here are the things that I've, I, I've added and you can add your own ideas. The first, low salary. The second, bad schedule. The third, no job security. The fourth, a toxic workplace, which means it's difficult to work with people. The fifth, no plan for advancement. And then maybe you have another other ideas. Why do they leave? Yeah, it's interesting that the one of the things salary salary trumps a lot. You can put up with a lot with with uh, if you have a good salary, but a low salary, and then you have other issues like that toxic environment or no plan for advancement. The, that makes it there's no there's rarely a point in staying, or if you stay you may not be doing your best work. And I wanna show you what some of these great teachers that I know have said about this subject as well. And the plan, yeah, I can see the plan for advancement, I think is so important. If people feel, is this just a temporary gig? And I know, you know, once an adjunct, always an adjunct is a very, is a very difficult place to be in. And that, you know, adjunct we use here in the United States to describe someone who's kind of always a part-timer. And I don't know if this is true in Russia, but here, sometimes people have to, they have to jump from one job to another. So they do part-time here, part-time here, part-time here. They don't feel like they're part of any community. 
and they're also driving a lot. And this is a great reason why you should start your own business and find good people to work with you. So let's see what these teachers had to say. Thank you for those comments, guys. One teacher noted that there are a lot of work commitments, which I'm responsible for, and a lack of opportunities and sponsorship or mentorship, I would call it, for me to upgrade new advanced knowledge. How do we get to move forward? These elements resulted in overwhelming stress, as well as not catching up with education quality. That raises another issue. You know, everybody and everyone in every job needs to determine if the costs are worth the rewards. The rewards are worth the cost. Yeah, the rewards are worth the cost. That's better. Sometimes, even with a good paying job, if the stress is too much or if it becomes too routine or it's seen as a dead end job, you can start to lose good people. It's not always easy to address those issues, but it's important to notice them. Here's another teacher who noted that poor working environment, large number of students, uh, availability, availability of materials, uh, a few, uh, just a small number of teachers, salary, of course, and leadership was a big challenge in the past. According to this teacher, the past head teacher was too harsh and didn't have what this teacher calls moral leadership. And it made me hate my job and it made me want to leave my job. Now, you know, there are some things we cannot control, but there may be creative ways to at least make incremental or small improvements. One element of good leadership is to lead by example. So if you want your teachers to work hard, you should be willing to do the same. Here's another teacher being overworked, doing jobs I didn't enjoy. And maybe there were jobs that he or she did not realize came with the job from when, when they were hired. Following a strict curriculum without room to innovate or pivot based on student needs. Low pay, of course, and exhausted leadership. And that actually goes to that other side where you're, you're working so hard running your business that you are, you're getting burned out. You know, it's also, it's good to identify local issues that could be factors and then determine what are the factors that just can't be changed and which ones can be changed and then try to set out those changes if possible. I wanna to move to a second area here. And a great way I believe to keep teachers is to show that you value their unique insights, education, and experience. We all deserve to be valued and we all appreciate it when we are valued. One thing that we've done here, and this is from uh, my colleague, Margareta Larson, is we've taken the idea of observations and made it part of professional development. If done correctly, it's a wonderful way for teachers to learn about new techniques and share their expertise. In our program, we ask teachers to go to two other classes as informal observers for 15 minutes. They then write up two compliments and two suggestions, not complaints or criticism, suggestions. Um, it's useful to go over effective ways to write suggestions so they don't sound like criticism, even if it is. You know, our teachers, the teachers in our program have had a lot of fun with this because they see it as less stressful. I'm not involved. It's them with their peers. Uh, and they and it's short. It's not a long thing. And they get to see other teachers in action, which validates a lot of what they're doing. So here's an example of one of these two plus twos. Uh, from the, this past semester. In the compliments, she says, it's such a well-planned and executed class. She used a timer in the class, and that was great uh, because it allowed the students to know that things were ending. And then just as the class was out of time, a student said that they didn't understand something. And you acknowledged the student's difficulty and made it clear that the following class would start with that point. Beautiful things to hear about your own teaching. And then she said, well, I thought you could also make me do a better job of, of showing similarities and differences between two types of structures um, and maybe use, use these, the, the language of examples, which was the target area with students' own experiences. 
So it's really nice. And of course, she ended it to just say how much she enjoyed enjoyed it. I want to just mention one thing about this kind of task. It can still feel like another hoop for teachers to jump through, which means extra work. So you have to try and figure out creative ways to make it fun and engaging for them if you can, uh, by maybe giving prizes, maybe cutting it down to one instead of two teachers, you know, things like that. I cannot emphasize enough how valuable it is to show support in whatever ways you, that you can for your teachers. Here at Georgia State's IEP, we encourage them to present at conferences. And I saw something in the chat room about presenting at conferences. And when things like COVID shut conferences down for us, well, we had our own mini conferences. Enthusiasm for this kind of thing from the director and from other folks who are in the, in the administration, it's infectious. If you're enthusiastic, others will too. If you can find the money or funds to support it, great. But even if you just encourage them, even if you can't get them the money, I think that has a positive impact. And you can do other small things, provide coffee, do lunches, show kindness when tragedy strikes for somebody in your program. And I think you could probably think of other ideas as well. Now, this is something, uh, it's, this, is a, this is something I'm gonna ask you to save. I want you to write this in the Padlet uh, later on so that we can talk about these next, next in, in two weeks when we meet again. What can you as a director do to make the situation better for your EFL teachers in Russia? And I'm gonna, I want you to think about that and I want you to add those to the Padlet so we can look at those next time. Because uh, I do think it's very important. And here's what one of our teachers said. Improve the teaching environment by recruiting more teachers based on the student ratio. Again, is it is it financially possible? That's something you have to determine. Provide strong facilities like books, classrooms. Increase the salary, of course. And recognizing the good job that they're doing. So some recognition is important. And this this teacher was saying, well, the director needs to improve the work environment and foster democracy in the workplace so that all voices can be heard. And the director should be ahead of the curve in managing and putting advanced methodologies and skills into action. The director should also encourage initiatives from teachers, give them opportunities to improve their knowledge and their skills, and they should be supportive when teachers need support. Encouraging teamwork so that we can add more materials and programs. Be positive. Try to avoid pushing teachers to work too much. Be honest about performance. Be accessible. Um, here's somebody who, who really likes her director it's because they're sharing experiences and how they can implement new ideas in their teaching. Discussing the problems that they're facing. And, you know, we're all human beings, we're all people, uh, and then trying to find real solutions for the concern. And to show praise and, to, and leadership by encouraging everybody. And you need to trust your teachers so that you build confidence and believe in their potential. And I'm going to jump to a slightly negative thing. What should a director avoid? Well, they're saying you shouldn't take steps that without consulting your teachers and then convincing them that that's the best thing. Doing things behind their back. Uh, focusing so much on final, being exam oriented, focusing on the final exams. And this I think is very interesting. You focus of course on your students' well being, but also look at your teachers and to recognize the work that's done by everybody and to not miss people's good work and just focus on some people. And here, another way to avoid, uh, the, the things that the director should avoid doing is making decisions that are harmful to the teacher's interests, uh, avoid treating employees unfairly and Avoid having this attitude that 
whatever I say is right and that the teachers have to obey him or her because we all are imperfect humans and we can really learn a lot from each other, including directors learning from teachers and being accessible and transparent and avoiding vagueness and hierarchy. Another way to value teachers is to provide opportunities for them to help improve the program. Now I have to tell you, as a director, not as a teacher, I love doing this as a teacher, but as a director, it can be hard to hear sometimes, but it's very important, but you have to be Zen, calm, or maybe step out of the room and let them talk. Actually, during this little, this little session here where the teachers were talking, I think I did leave the room so that they could talk more freely and my blood pressure wouldn't go up too much. Uh, but it's important to hear. Um, and we, it's also wonderful to have instructors work together to brainstorm about new projects to keep the program vibrant and innovative. It's empowering and it really helps the program. Here's a, a group of three of my wonderful folks who helped create that community-based program for refugees that I mentioned. They are passionate, engaged, smart, and they, they did a great job and it led to more work for us and a great presence in the community. And speaking of community, building community is so important. And one of the best ways to do that, food. Uh, as you can see at the bottom of this picture, we have an incredible array of, this is Afghan food that was prepared by one of our uh, immigrant students. So every December we have a retreat where we can talk about our successes or challenges, the joys and the frustrations, and then eat a lot of good food and just talk to each other and connect as people. Um, you know, any extra fun activities that can, can also help make teachers feel connected. As one of our earlier teachers mentioned, you, you have a sense of community and almost a sense of family. Now I've been focusing on teachers, but the same ideas really apply for staff. Everyone is valuable and everyone does better work when they know that they are appreciated. For us, when we faced real challenges with COVID, our amazing staff, these two guys right here, gladly took on some teaching roles to help us out. They both had TESOL graduate degrees and helped pull us through. It was in their best interest and in for the program, and it helped us all bond together. So creating that team-like atmosphere means that everybody pulls together for the common good, for students, for themselves, and for the program. It takes being mindful and deliberate as a director, but it pays off by creating a healthy workplace where people enjoy coming in. So thank you so much for attending. I also want to thank my wonderful friends, and I'm going to name them right here. There's Manel, who is from Algeria, Robin, who teaches here in the United States, Nazira, who is an English teacher in Kazakhstan, Daniela, who is from Mexico, Ton, who teaches English and math in Vietnam, Sadath, who is from Tanzania, Roxana from Paraguay, Laurent, also from Tanzania, Dildora, a great teacher from Uzbekistan, Bayan, who teaches in Lebanon, and Eileen, who is from Mexico. I'm so grateful to them because they shared their ideas openly with me. And one last thing, as you start your business, I want you to remember, don't take yourself too seriously. And my email is there on the, on the screen as well. And I'm happy to connect with you especially through the Padlet. You can post questions, ideas, thoughts, anything that you like. I've got the, I, I know the Padlet is in the, um, in the chat room, but the, and the little QR code is there. So I think I'm almost done, but don't forget Marcy's session. Marcel Morris is gonna be presenting on online models for English teachers on April 12th, you'll be moving to the online world where we all must end up, I'm afraid. It's wonderful. I think you're gonna have a great uh, time learning from Marcy about uh, the online models. Oh, oh yes, one more thing. Please come and join me 
on March 29th, 5 p.m. Moscow time, when we will engage more conversationally. Here, you've just been hearing my voice. Uh, I really look forward to it. Please be safe and stay healthy.